Let's go. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, dear participants, and welcome from the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity. We have a new setup in this session today. We had to change the room, but here we are. My name is uh, Frederick Vogel, and I'm joined here in Montreal by my colleague, Jesse Monnier. Jesse is online. Uh, Abhinav Prakash couldn't join today. I think maybe he will join us from home later, and uh, Eri Tamale in the room here. Thank you for joining us today for the fifth webinar of the Knowledge Management for Biodiversity Initiative. So this series has started more than a month ago with presentation addressing the global knowledge management issues. And then we dived into the regional knowledge management initiative. Last week, we could hear from two presenters introducing us to their national biodiversity knowledge management realities. They were from Belgium and Ghana. They told us how they have introduced KM in their national strategies and action plans. For those who are interested to review or view the recordings and the summaries and the presentations, please head to the website km4b.cbd.int. Today, we will hear from two organizations that have been addressing knowledge management across their project's portfolio. They will showcase the process from capturing knowledge to disseminating it, and we will try to learn from their vast experience. The theme of today's presentation is knowledge management in uh, biodiversity project management. We are very lucky to have with us two teams working in the agriculture sector, one from the Food and Agriculture Organization, and the second one from IFAD, which is the International Fund for Agriculture Development. Before we dive into their presentation, let me just inform you that the chat function is open to everyone to exchange, but the CBD team and the panelists will only be monitoring the Q&A function of Zoom, which is one of the button next to the chat button uh, at the bottom of your, of your screen. Here it's yeah, maybe the third button from my left, but maybe it's different on your uh, interface. And finally, for those who could not attend this live session and that are now listening to the recording, and for those who want to continue the discussion after the live, we have prepared a forum space on our website where all participants, panelists, and the Secretariat staff can further elaborate on the topics addressed during the webinars. Without further ado, let me now give the floor to our first presenter and her team. It's Frédéric Matras. Mrs. Matras is the coordinator of the Knowledge Platform for Emergencies and Resilience, CORE, at the Food and Agriculture Organization. She will share with us CORE's experience in capturing knowledge and the way the team responds to emergencies. She will be addressing a specific project related to biodiversity. Mr. Matras, dear colleagues from FAO, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frédéric. So my name is also Frédéric. <laughs> I'm very, very happy to be here uh, with, the, with the core team, as we are not used actually to be invited as presenter. We are more used to be hosting webinars. So uh, it's quite an interesting event for us. I'm very happy to hear that knowledge management is put uh, at the forefront. So while I'm sharing my screen, I just wanted to uh, present the various speakers from, from our team core. Um, so we have uh, Lucia Palombi. Um, they won't be presenting themselves during the presentation as we will we'll exchange different slides. So Lucia Palombi, Charlotte Maslow, and Natalie Boya. So, uh, as you see, it is a small team. We are quite busy in our work. So what I will uh, start with, and then uh, if you can confirm that you see uh, my presentation in the proper way. Okay. Um, so today we're going to uh, to present you the work that we do within our division on emergencies and resilience. So first of all, CORE. CORE is a little pun and acronym uh, when we started a few years back as we were a knowledge platform only for resilience. So CORE right, is knowledge for resilience. We've expanded a little bit and we're now a knowledge platform on emergencies and resilience within uh, the FAO divisions on emergencies and resilience. Um, and we're going to provide you a little bit with an overview of the background of our, our knowledge and learning frameworks, and then reflect a little bit with you at the end of the presentation, how can that be applied 
um, and the fact that we work on emergency resilience and very much look at the resilience of um, food systems, how that can be used for um, bio biodiversity. Um, so I just want to start with what I'm not going to be able to look at the chat box while I'm speaking, my colleagues will. I just want to start with maybe asking some of you uh, to just give us a little bit of idea of how you are involving KM, how you see KM, how you understand KM, um, how important it is for you or if you're missing, just to have a little bit understanding of who is uh, joining us today. So my colleagues will have a look and then we'll certainly... Uh, have a look also after the, the event. Thank you. So start with the broad and very uh, generic definition of what we work on. The forest knowledge management, um, and, and we want I want to anchor that concept because it can also be a, a buzzword. We want to make sure that we all are in the same understanding of it. Forest knowledge management is the systematic uh, and intentional capturing and structuring of knowledge why we're also fostering the its effective use through adoption and adaptation. So you will see that we work on all these different contexts, the systematic uh, aspects of it, the capturing, the structuring, and uh, the, the use and uh, adaptation of those framework. Um, what is core? Core, we work on really two very broad uh, main areas. I mean, two statements that would fit us. Uh, we really, a platform acts as a knowledge broker uh, to facilitate all sorts of uh, multi-sexual and multi-stakeholders knowledge processes. Um, some may be focusing on uh, the generation of learning, some may be on the co-creation aspect of it, some of the knowledge sharing. Um, but we also, um, and that's a very, very important part of our theme, we also act as a... Um, uh, as a facilitator in embedding systematic knowledge and learning processes across uh, all the operations of the division across the emergency and resilience programming. We are located in the programming uh, team of the division. Uh, that is really uh, the objective um, to, to support the, uh, the, the programming and to really work for better programming. Um, just in a snapshot, and for those of us who don't know us, um, you see on the left a little bit of our outputs. So we've worked on a 60 plus documentation of good and promising practices. We are facilitating all sorts of events. Um, but really, you see what, what is really important are the different areas. Um, we support the mapping of knowledge priorities, which is for us the first, first, first uh, event action that, that we need to do in order to be able to support the knowledge management processes. Of course, we work on good practices. Uh, we also work with relevant colleagues on the collection of data and evidence. Uh, we design, we support the design and facilitation um, with country offices of all sorts of sharing and knowledge sharing events, learning events. We also collaborate with the communications team uh, on a whole suite of knowledge visibility products so that KM products are also uh, visible. We also support all our colleagues in framing key messages, uh, come back to that maybe later. Uh, we uh, support the uses uh, of, of the knowledge, um, also supporting communities of practices. And there's a big aspect uh, of our work that is more toward the methodological support and the capacity development aspect in order to uh, develop capacities. I'm going fast because this is really a snapshot of it, and I want to go to the uh, to, uh, to to the heart of our work. Also, just to to uh, frame the the scope of our work, so we work uh, for emergencies and resilience. The context for us, we work in fragile context, um, and the background is the uh, the protracting uh, uh, nature of the crisis uh, of the food insecurity level. And the knowledge work here is really to understand what we can do differently, how we can address food crisis better, and how we can reverse those trends. So for us at CORE and for FAO in general, what does that mean? That means that a key aspect of our work is really to strengthen the evidence and the knowledge base. Um, it's not necessarily to expand the knowledge base, as there are the, the knowledge, there's a lot of knowledge, but really to systematize, to contextualize, to work on the evidence um, and then continuously updating and enriching uh, all the, the knowledge. 
with uh, the mindset of the resilience being complementary, bringing the complementarity between a more short-term emergency response and a more long-term uh, response, looking at, for example, how agriculture intervention um, can lace pathways to resilience is a cost-effective uh, intervention and looking at the resilience of food system. So this is just the, the just to to anchor uh, the the work that we do so that you understand. And then um, as we go on the presentation, we are going to look at how that can be applied to uh, biodiversity. So now let me uh, show you a little bit what uh, our, our concept. Basically, in this slide, you will see how we see knowledge management and what we focus on very much for us. Knowledge management um, is a bit of a metaphor as the iceberg, meaning there's a lot of work that you see, a lot of outputs that you can see that we do uh, in terms of you know, podcasts and webinars and uh, web articles, e-learning, documenting good practices, et cetera, et cetera, animation video, et cetera. But a lot of work is actually underground, setting the scene and more strategic uh, work uh, looking at the different pillars of knowledge management that I will explain in a minute, really much looking at what processes, what systematic and internal and intentional processes need to be uh, set up, what stakeholders need to be involved for each knowledge management activity, what resources need to be used, what tools can be developed. Um, and the last very uh, important aspect of the work is really not to consider knowledge management as an end in itself, um, there is a, uh, an objective to it, and the outcomes that we really uh, don't want to lose sight from is really an uh, expanded knowledge base on, uh, on, on, on evidence-based good practices for better programming, uh, a strengthened evidence-based programming, um, very much lo looking to inform decision-making, to inform advocacy, and in our case, uh, within the division, see how we can also guide resource mobilization. Um, and as um, the last part of our, of our activity is really looked at enhanced capacity um, with our country offices, in all the fragile contexts in which we operate, and trying to um, embed a learning culture. So the two frameworks that we, uh, we work on, um, the backbone of our work is the knowledge management framework that you see here in blue um, with the five pillars. And this is really a uh, guiding of our work. So if you look at the bottom one, uh, which is the, uh, the main objective that we have to make sure that the knowledge uh, is being used for the right purpose. Now for knowledge to be used, it has to be shared properly. And I'm going backwards in my pillars. And for it, and there's a whole sort of activities that my colleagues will explain in that. In order for the knowledge to be shared properly, it needs to be captured also properly. And that's why we also develop guidance and tool and support uh, on that pillar. Going backwards for the knowledge to be captured properly, you need to have the, the right generation of knowledge and learning. Here again, you're gonna have guidance, uh, proper methodological support and tools to do that. And in order for the knowledge to be generated, uh, last but not least, the first aspect that we look at is the identification and the framing of what we intend to frame, what we intend uh, to do at the time, what are the priorities. So within that backbone, this is really the knowledge management pillars of our work, uh, we are working a lot on a uh, learning agenda framework, which is very similar um, and has a different step that I will uh, explain a little bit in details. And we, we've been involved in several countries in fragile contexts, for example, Nigeria, Afghanistan, and Somalia, trying to support the implementation of learning agenda, which follows a little bit the same concept to framing the learning, generating, documenting, and uh, working on adaptive management. So I went very fast because I want to uh, give the space for my colleagues to, uh, to give details on this. But the, the last slide that I would like to focus on is give you a little bit um, an idea of, of what we mean by a learning agenda. What do we do? And this is our, our, our concept that we follow with, uh, with country offices um, implementing the learning agenda. So the, the first step that we do with them um, is trying to identify uh, their learning priorities, looking, so that's the step one, framing the learning 
looking at the particular intervention. Is it a project? Is it more a programmatic intervention? Is it a country uh, plan? Is it a country strategy? Um, so really trying to frame the learning priorities to any other strategy in place, um, trying to also make linkages with other strategies, um, and try to also build a rational and justification on those learning priorities. When this is uh, achieved and uh, accomplished, then we uh, look at what learning activities uh, can be uh, implemented looking very much at the different resources um, and different sources of information, whether it's existing, whether there is a meal framework, um, where, whether uh, we work with m &E colleagues, because there are a lot of existing information and data, a lot of evidence that exists. So we need to map out this against the learning priorities. And then we also look into planning generation of new learning activities, and those are, can be of very many different forms. And then looking at the plan, the time frame, and the resources. So this is very crucial because very often we find there is a fragmentation of uh, information and evidence and sources of information. So this is important to try to put in one place all the relevant data and frame it, for, frame the scope of those data in order to answer the learning priorities. Then once this is done, uh, then we develop the products. We make a plan in what type of product. Is it a learning product? Is it a good practices? Do we have enough evidence uh, in order uh, to uh, address the learning priorities in the form of learning questions. Um, and the last step that you see in green that is very uh, um, innovative a little bit and, and difficult to implement is really follow up to make sure uh, that the learning that has been generated is actually used for the right purpose, whether it's internal within our country offices or whether it's external. So I'm going to stop here because there's a lot more to say in details. Uh, I went over in, in generic terms because we don't have much time um, to, to go into details, but just wanted to say, if you have any questions and comments, please put them in the chat box while my colleagues are going to provide you with, uh, with details. Um, and then they're going to give you a little bit more details of what of the framework that I uh, presented in jail. So please free to use the chat box. I will have a look and we will uh, make sure we uh, address those questions later in the webinar. Thank you very much. And over to my colleague, Lucia. Thank you very much, Frédéric. Good morning, good afternoon, colleagues. So um, I will give you a bit more details about the pillars of the uh, knowledge management framework that um, Frédéric has just introduced. So the, fir the first one is about framing and identifying um, the scope and objectives of the uh, knowledge work uh, we, we want to embark on. So it is about uh, mapping the knowledge and also learning priorities and needs, uh, formulating the related learning questions uh, by assessing um, the, uh, the criteria that can identify uh, a good or promising practice that may be related to uh, the positive effects and good results of an intervention, their sustainability, uh, link to inclusivity, participatory process, feasibility, replicability, and um, adaptability. And as we are um, based in the Office of Emergencies and Resilience at FAO, the focus of our work is about uh, resilience and um, resilience related factors. So the questions to ask ourselves in this uh, particular pillar is what do I know and what do I want to know more about a specific um, intervention and practice? The tools that um, we can use uh, um, in this uh, um, step of the knowledge management framework can be a, a diagnosis matrix, uh, a thematic guide, um, facilitation technique in terms of, you know, how to better identify uh, a body of knowledge and um, a knowledge management plan, as well as the learning table, learning agenda table that uh, Frédéric has just presented. So as you can see in the next slide, uh, the second step 
of, of, the, uh, of the framework is about the generation of knowledge. So at this moment, we really need to ask ourselves what uh, is the qualitative and quantitative information that is available uh, to, uh, um, you know, to really document a good or promising practice and what is missing. So what we can do um, to, to really gather additional evidence that can strengthen the evidence base of the knowledge management uh, products that we want to develop. So this pillar is about identifying the relevant uh, sources of information. And, um, and we could do this through uh, um, anecdotal evidence uh, based in stories, feedback, testimonials, uh, but also scientific and technical evidence that can be hosted in evaluation reports, studies, uh, and expert reviews. And finally, but also very important, empirical evidence uh, which is uh, linked to uh, observations, pilot testing, um, you know, especially at field level. Um, so the objective here is to enhance the production of evidence and to also facilitate processes of knowledge co-creation. And we can do this by using a learning review methodology, uh, a learning roadmap tool, but also qualitative research questionnaires that can really go, you know, and uh, help us um, interact with, with those that are at the forefront of the implementation of a certain, certain practice. So uh, the third pillar um, is about capturing. Did we lose my colleagues in, in HQ? I think we have lost uh, the presentations uh, for a while. So it was... Yeah. I'm really sorry. I was, uh, I was kicked out. <laughs> Something wrong yeah, with my have, internet we, connection. All of us, sorry. all of us, I, I, I don't know, in the room, obviously. I, so let me reshare my screen again. Where did you lose us? Which, which period? That's when... Um, before pillar three, yeah. okay, I was just about to move to pillar three. Yeah. That, that was I'm a really page where well listening. I'm yeah. really sorry. <laughs> your phone? Yeah, we were disconnected. Far, obviously, let me share again. Yeah. So okay. So we okay. were at the third pillar of the uh, knowledge management frame framework, which is about capturing <laughs> the knowledge that we have identified and. Um, uh, and also generate it. So what I was saying is that at core, we, um, we have developed a template that we use to capture uh, good, promising and emerging practices. Um, it's, a, it's a really uh, thorough and detailed template that can give the you know, opportunity to explain uh, in details um, the uh, uh, methodological approach, geographic coverage, um, impact, lessons learned, and uh, all the elements also related to the re replicability and upscaling um, uh, of a certain uh, practice. We, um, this can really help us um, identify what best captures and promotes uh, experiences and learning. And um, to do this, as I said, we have developed a generic good practice template, but we also have specific good practice templates that can really help us uh, go into more detail in um, assessing and documenting uh, interventions that are related to, for example, anticipatory action, social protection and resilience, um, and all the aspects that may be related to uh, uh, emergency and 
and resilience work in the agri-food system. Um, we have also developed um, uh, questionnaires that can help us um, um, collect qualitative data, and this can lead us in the development of a suite of knowledge and learning pro products. I will stop it here to pass the floor to uh, uh, my colleague, Natalie. Uh, over to you, Natalie. Thanks so much, Lucia. So uh, the pillars, identification, generation, and capture, though fundamental, would be incomplete and in some cases almost futile if lessons learned and evidence collected are not disseminated, um, right? <laughs> so especially if disseminated to the right person and in a timely manner. So we, we know that um, information isn't very useful when it's received late. So um, although it can be challenging, it is very, it needs to be made available, readily available. Hence the importance of the pillar, the fourth pillar, which is dissemination. So dissemination or sharing uh, mainly focuses on making available to our audiences the knowledge gained and the important messages around thematic topics related to areas of work or interest within the framework of emergencies and resilience, of course. And at CORE, we, we, we try to use a variety of channels to achieve this. Um, the, primary, the primary one being the knowledge platform for emergencies and resilience, also simply known as CORE, of course, which I will copy and paste in the chat right now. So there you have it. And if you browse through, you find a wealth, a wealth of resources ranging from good practices and briefs and the news on upcoming events, workshop videos, including animations, photo galleries, and links to our e-learning series and so on. Uh, we, have also, we also have a thematic series page where we post recordings of webinars and other virtual conversations, which we have either coordinated or supported. And we also make sure to include related links of the resources that um, are useful or interesting. So in addition to the platform, whenever necessary, we also leverage social media platforms such as Twitter, also known as X now, for spreading word or promoting events, um, or, or events or products that we we have. And um, now, since we, we don't have an account on X, we collaborate with comms and, our, and outreach teams in order to get our content uh, on these platforms. So that said, dissemination really involves a lot of communication and collaboration with different teams within FAO and also with external KM partners for cross-pollination to happen. And Frederic touched on this import, the importance of these these collaborations earlier. So we have we so we have colleagues circulate our products within their networks, and we do the same. And so that is why you you will find on the platform more than just the products. You find also products from other cane partners. That said, an important question to ask or consider early in this phase of dissemination is who really is my audience and how can I, how best can I reach them within the constraints of the capacities and resources available? And what tools do I have at my disposal? And some of the tools that we take advantage of at core currently are newsletters, um, digests, which are simply snapshots or highlights of our good and promising practices and learning groups, for instance, um, webinars and so on. So that is the, the foundation of this pillar, mainly focusing on um, showcasing knowledge and key messages and sharing knowledge via these different platforms and channels. And, and that's it for me. Thank you. And I'll take over as the last member of core team to finish this presentation. And I'll try and be quick uh, to leave sufficient time also for if I have the colleagues and, and for questions and answers. Um, so very quickly on this last pillar, which is uptake, as uh, my colleague said earlier, uh, knowledge uh, is useful if it's actually you know, informing and influencing the decisions that we make uh, to um, 
to work in a better and more effective manner, not only ourselves within FAO, but also with the wider range of stakeholders um, who are intervening around the same portfolio of interventions. Um, so this pillar is really about making sure that the knowledge is used and is operationalized, um, that it's informing programming and policy work. And also, as Frederick said earlier, no, we really approach knowledge management and learning as a continuous process, especially in the field of emergencies and resilience, where we work in contexts uh, with you know, rapid changes and, and shocks and stresses. Um, and we need to be able to adapt. Um, we never talk about the best practice because we think a practice is good and can only be improved and uh, readapted and and um, and refined, you know, um, along um, along different, I mean, new experiences and uh, and at the light of new evidence generated. So we're really focusing on those systematic approaches of refining and enriching and updating our knowledge to make sure that it's also. Um, harnessing uh, the, the most recent experiences. Um, we have developed some tools like good practice database. We at CORE use a tagging system um, and, and keyword system to also be able to access uh, knowledge on, on specific topics that are either you know, very concrete like social protection or cash or, um, um, I mean, th those elements of intervention. But we also know that in the programming and, and, and specifically in the policy sector of humanitarian and development work. There are also a lot of cross-cutting approaches like localization, community engagement, uh, the humanitarian development peace nexus, the climate peace and security nexus. So those cut across a, a great variety of, of interventions and type of practices. And so um, those databases and inventories that we are building are also um, helping us to you know, really point to uh, the um, the knowledge that is actually um, useful to inform those um, cross-cutting dimensions of uh, of our work. And as we said earlier, we also monitor, we track, we gather feedback on our products that were relevant uh, to the needs of our audiences, which when identify how we can improve them, um, the, the content, also the process of, of generating and disseminating those, uh, those knowledge and learning. Um, and yeah, the key question is really, how you know making sure that learning and knowledge can serve program and policy needs and, and identifying how this can be done in the most effective way. Um, in the next slide, just to give you uh, an idea, so those pillars and the learning agenda framework, which is a way for us to translate our KM approach into programming through this you know learning agenda approach, has been translated and put at uh, everyone's disposal on this uh, FAO e-learning academy. We have this e-learning series on specifically the role of knowledge management and learning for emergency and resilience programming with all of, you know, suites of tools and examples. So um, don't hesitate. Um, I think my colleague will copy the link to the e-learning series if some of you are interested. And you can watch this little introductory video, which lasts for like two, three minutes that gives, you know, um, an overview of what, what we do and, and why this is important uh, specifically for emergencies and resilience. And now moving to uh, the biodiversity aspect, um, which um, is, as indicated here, critical for sustainable and resilient agri-food systems. Um, and based on what you've heard before, uh, now we're trying going to, to see a bit what is the opportunity of a KM approach to support um, the work of the um, global biodiversity uh, prevention. Um, so indeed, uh, there are two aspects I think under consideration. There's the way, you know, the global agri-food system as one of the primary drivers of biodiversity loss, how it can transform to reverse, you know, those negative um, impacts on, on biodiversity, but also, and more specifically for us, core, what we would be looking at is how Agriculture and food-based livelihoods and the populations who depend on those livelihoods, um, how can they be more resilient um, considering the effects of biodiversity loss and what that means in terms of you know, soil depletion and um, the, um, sorry, that's with a timer, <laughs> but now we're moving a bit 
beyond the 30 minutes allocated to us, but I'll be quick again. Um, and so really trying to see how we can build resilient ecosystems, resilient livelihoods, and, and resilient people, no? Um, our work is really focusing on countries and geographical areas where uh, there are multiple threats and risks uh, compounding and, and, and reinforcing each other. The meteorological risk like you know, uh, climate change and climate variability and na natural hazards, the environmental risks like biodiversity loss and resources depletion, as I said, but also other type of risks that we are um, highly focusing on, like social risks in terms of conflict and forced displacement um, and economic risks, of course. And so our knowledge management perspective and, and the way we also apply our framework is really how we can understand how all these risks are reinforcing each other and and try to identify solutions no, that um, help uh, understand through what pathways of agricultural-based livelihoods and interventions we can address through a multi-risk uh, management approach uh, those different drivers um, of, um, of, of risk and, and conflict and displacement and everything. Um, and so here in that case, KM helps us um, to put a lens on vulnerable and fragile countries and to see at the light of this you know, great variety of, of risk drivers uh, where exactly allocated the evidence and knowledge gaps. Um, and, and so, of course, there you know, we can put a specific focus on the role of biodiversity itself for food security and nutrition. And what can be made, um, how can biodiversity contribute to strengthening the capacity to anticipate um, uh, risks and shocks and, and disasters, to adapt to those stresses, um, to mitigate the risks, uh, especially on the more vulnerable people. So, you know, applying the whole resilience um, capacity array to uh, the role of biodiversity um, specifically. Um, then, of course, um, as Frederic mentioned earlier, you know, we're also trying to really identify some local and context specific solutions. But what is interesting is to see to what extent can this become, you know, a scalable solution that other partners can can implement. So, you know, we really harness and strengthen the potential of agri-food systems um, to conserve and restore and, and, and sustainably use biodiversity. Um, the transfer of knowledge is, of course, I think something really important. Um, I'm not familiar with like the broad range of actors who are part of the, you know, the convention, uh, but I'm sure you have, you know, from local and national governmental stakeholders, community-based uh, organizations and associations of uh, producers and seeds multipliers and, uh, you know, um, academia and everything. And so it's really about this cross-fertilization and making sure that there's a way to bring all this great variety of knowledge and expertise together to identify and, and co create the solutions um, that uh, the biodiversity area of work um, can, can implement and really make that in a participatory and inclusive manner. And, and of course, that's really a key message in core, like everything relies on a deliberate formulation and implementation of knowledge and, and learning strategies. If we don't set you know, those like, clear priorities which are also endorsed um, by a greater variety of actors. It's, you know, efforts can be very dispersed, and 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 the information, you know, scattered, and 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 we lack or we miss opportunities to to make that knowledge, you know, uh, effectively captured and and utilized um, across actors. Two very quick examples. Um, that I can mention. Um, so this one, Somalia is an example of a good practice that CORE has documented, which was focusing on the expansion of the um, uh, Prosopis juliflora tree species, um, which was a threat to rural livelihoods. Um, and, and this good practice, you have the link here, and maybe we can add it as well in the, in the chat. Um, this practice really looked at like taking the entry point of you know livelihood diversification, how we turn these harmful species uh, harmful to the environment and harmful to you know the the survival of livestock and everything into something that can 
generate uh, income locally that can help populations adapt to, um, to, to climate change and, and, and drought more specifically, um, how using that um, actually helps you know, reverse and, and, um, and, and recover, regenerate uh, areas of land and protect um, indigenous uh, plant species. Um, so it's really about turning a threat into an opportunity at a local level. Um, and 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 creating employment for for young people, for example, um, and and so this is one good practice that that was documented, but new we we've seen since then uh, because it it was a few years back. Um, this practice being expanded widely uh, across Somalia and Somaliland, and we've been documenting um, additional or new type of impacts around that through um, video testimonials and everything. So. The, the knowledge keeps, you know, uh, being uh, enriched on, on that uh, specific um, example. And uh, another one in the Sahel, uh, here it's not linked to the learning agenda framework that um, my colleague Frédéric mentioned earlier. Uh, we had this project in the Liptako Gourma where um, we know that this is an area which is very exposed to the effects of climate change and there it's really accelerating the depletion of natural resources and also the competition between herders and farmers. Um, and, and so we had a specific learning question, which tried to see how we can empower young people and women and strengthen the resilience of vulnerable agro-pastoral populations. And one of the building block of that project was focusing on the restoration of degraded lands through community mobilization, through cash for work activities. So again, looking at how we can have a positive impact on the environment, but also on the local economy, um, on creating um, or increasing the opportunity cost of, you know, for young people specifically to not, I mean, to involve in, in violence, offering a new uh, income uh, and new, you know, livelihoods prospects um, and opportunities for young people, um, who you know otherwise would not be able to make a living from from farming activity, from sorry farming activities because the land is uh, um, um, was uh, the, the soil was really um, damaged in those areas and so we had that question as let's say an, an orientation and a backbone learning work um, and so we identified through questionnaires qualitative data and, and additional quantitative uh, qualitative research on the ground, um, to what extent these different components like cash for work and, and community mobilization and, and the activities on the land specifically had uh, you know, a positive effect on the resilience capacity of women and young people in, um, in this area. And so we've documented the, the, the learning process also, how we came to you know, bring all this data together to you know come up to um, uh, concrete learning and concrete lessons that can be applied into future programming in the Liptako Goma area um, and 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 of course there are always uh, things that can be better documented there are always some you know specific data gaps um, that can be identified and so the, the the FAO and other actors like being present in this area for since a long time and, and, and for again the years to come, you know, can contribute to um to document further the impact on, on the environment and on the, the societies in, in this area. Um so the product will soon be available on core platform. Uh, if, uh, you yeah and we can disseminate it with that network at a later stage. Thank you. Uh, sorry that was fast, but I hope understandable. Thank you very much for uh, for this uh, presentation, uh, Frederick and team in in FAO. But it was really interesting, and uh, even from the CBD standpoint, we are at the very beginning of, of this journey, and uh, you have paved uh, paved uh, the, the way on uh, your different approaches with the with the pillars, but as well with this uh, KN versus uh, learning, and it, it's very interesting. Thank you very much. We are over time, so without further ado, I will jump to the to the uh, IFAD colleagues. Uh, here we have, uh, I think, uh, Mausi Asoko, but maybe you can tell us more if Mausi or, um, or Mario will be presenting. So Mausi is from the International Fund for Agricultural Development. 
Uh, she is a technical specialist for biodiversity and knowledge management at IFAD, and she will tell us how IFAD is leveraging KM. Uh, she will expose the lessons they learned to boost quality with some example around biodiversity issues. I have seen a few questions in the question and answer. Uh, we will try to answer them while, uh, while um, IFAD is presenting, but as well, we'll have a session maybe a shortened version now, uh, session at the end of the presentation by IFAD for the, the question and answers. Uh, Mrs. Asagel, the floor is yours. Or Marie? Mm, I'll actually start. <laughs> uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> that's yeah, that's fine. That's fine. We are, as you gave us 30 minutes, that's a bit long for one person. So we are sharing different angles. So I'm Maria Diven. I'm the Senior Biodiversity Specialist, and I coordinate the implementation of our biodiversity strategy across IFAD work. So what is specific about this presentation is that we are not talking purely from the knowledge management team in IFAD, but we are rather talking from the investment and the operation side on how knowledge management uh, is very important to our IFAD work and um, what, what we do as IFAD. First, we'll present a bit how it connects to biodiversity, why it's important for us to have knowledge to innovate and integrate biodiversity, what IFAD is doing uh, in, in the knowledge management, but also how we generate and support knowledge across operations. And finally, uh, we'll delve in a bit more on what we do specifically in our biodiversity team and knowledge management work. So first, why uh, IFAD work and biodiversity uh, knowledge management is important. So what is IFAD? IFAD is an international financing institution and a specialized UN agency in Rome, like FAO. We provide many loans, but also grants, supplementary funds for to address rural poverty. So that's our core target, the rural poor, the most remote area. And we do that by investing in sustainable rural development, uh, investing in productive capacities, infrastructure, markets, natural resource management, and so on. And we intervene across the globe, notably in developing countries and most fragile countries, as for the map. So what distinguishes us is that we have really, we are one of the best rated agency in terms of accountability and attention to evidence and impact. So we have strong targets on social and environmental side. 35% of our projects should be gender transformative. And now we have moved to 40%, 60% nutrition sensitive, 60% youth sensitive, 40% of our finance should be in climate and 35% of it should be in nature-based solution with biodiversity impact as per our recent biodiversity strategy. We have also target to have projects with indigenous people, with people with disabilities, and 90% so of all our projects need to build adaptive capacity. So all our work on climate adaptation is very closely linked also to our nature and biodiversity agenda. So what does it mean, biodiversity in IFAD? We did a, a small stock take a few years back when we started really engaging more explicitly to understand what it means. What do we do on biodiversity? And we realize it's a big part of our investment. 70% of our loans were found to have specific component or activities on biodiversity. Notably, a lot of it is around governance of natural resource, community natural resource management, community-driven development with landscape planning, bringing nature and farming systems. So, Restoration is a big angle. Also, of course, a lot of our agricultural work and production work is on agroecology, which is, as you know, target 10 of our global biodiversity framework. Then we work on value chain and market, including non-forest timber product, niche market, land rates, and um, value chain that valorize genetic diversity, seed conservation. And we have also um, very strong safeguards uh, that try to prevent any conversion to critical habitats, work on invasive alien species, minimizing of agrochemical and so on. So that's the type of investment uh, we do. We've also mapped uh, our interventions across the global biodiversity framework. And we saw uh, our investment really work across very different targets. And we have organized a strategy to really trying to strengthen our alignment to the global biodiversity framework. And we hope even in our accountability to be a bit more closer to some of this framework. And our key entry point is one, to have a holistic approach that balance nature and people. We combine our really people-centered approach with our landscape holistic agroecological approach. And having this people-centered approach that looks at how we can ensure 
co-benefits for the people, whereas in climate resilience, nutrition diversity, jobs, incentives, and so on, and how we can mobilize public-private finance to invest, so along the targets and so on. So why is it important, knowledge management for biodiversity? So we do a number of things on biodiversity, but we didn't know we were doing it because it was not an explicit terms. And so we have a lot of work to be more explicit and stronger to even bring more biodiversity in this investment. So we undertake a study to try to see what were the challenges and success in the portfolio to integrate biodiversity. And as you see, big part of the challenge was a lack of understanding. People don't necessarily understand what it means biodiversity. The capacities, the fact that we didn't have target, that we didn't get the evidence generated. Meanwhile, on the success side was project that was managing to bring evidence on biodiversity impact and benefits for our general targets, or being able to share successfully fad experience. So we realized that from an operation point of view, among the key elements is that we need, if we want to bring more biodiversity explicitly, we need to make the case during our investment project. And knowledge is a key entry point. A second part is that when we design our project, we need to be able to integrate concrete activities. We need to defend them. We need to showcase a theory of change where these activities can have impact. Our integrating biodiversity can have impact on our other target, whereas on climate, nutrition, income, we need, we need knowledge to show that we need indicator. We need capacities. And finally, of course, a key entry point is to have this quality monitoring and evaluation, knowledge management, so that we can feed again in making the case and integrating quality activities. So knowledge is really at the heart of our biodiversity strategy. I won't go into detail there because we don't have necessarily biodiversity targets. Uh, I mean, we have to have 30% in nature-based solution. If we want to have all our investment really biodiversity positive, we need to make the case that biodiversity loss is affecting every intervention of IFAD, whereas like the sustainable natural resource management, climate, nutrition, socioeconomic. Meanwhile, different options, biodiversity positive options can bring more sustainable natural resource man management, can enhance climate resilience, can bring diverse and safe food and socioeconomic benefits. So that's our challenge. That's why knowledge management and evidence is so important. I'll just bring one example from uh, last year. I was involved in a design of a project in Laos, which was a purely nutrition project. In IFA, nutrition is about nutrition diversity. And it was in uh, upland mountain uh, area of Laos. And I realized uh, it was a second step, second phase. So I was involved in the completion study of the first phase. And I realized they only worked on home garden, agroecology, and they forgot when I was looking at the evidence, the reports, or the knowledge, I realized that um, this population actually depend a lot on wild food, on the environment for their diet. So by bringing the evidence and showing that the natural resource management degradation leads to loss of wild food and decreased nutrition diversity, I was able to start, and then by having ideas of specific interventions, we were able to bring biodiversity in this nutrition project, both by promoting wild food, promotion and conservation, also by creating niche and, and protect the environment to have better fish capture and other things, have specific support on niche value chain and building awareness on the nutrition forest biodiversity linkage. And of course we need it knowledge on all these uh, steps. So this is just a, um, an example to showcase why we need to continue having more evidence there. Uh, so now uh, I'll move on to, and I will let now Mahusi also introduce a bit, what, what do we do in IFAD on knowledge? So how the knowledge work we do can feed this need for evidence on biodiversity, but also other things. So Mahusi, over to you. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Marie Oud. And now I really want to say that in IFAD, our first objective for knowledge management is to improve how we generate, assess, share, and use the best available knowledge to achieve result, impact, and influence. That's mean knowledge management is very key uh, in all our, during all our project cycle and so on. And then we have a uh, three key step or strategy to integrate knowledge management in our work. First of all is to leverage internal and external knowledge to deliver high quality evidence-based solution. And then 
we cannot do anything and forget about our people. So we really place people and their knowledge at the core of all our activities. And why do we do that? What is the uh, theory of change we are following is to really articulate how action address the underlying constraint and how they are expected to achieve if at impact. So, um, like I said, knowledge management play a, a key role in our operation. First of all, we need to build capacity of country program because if had, we really work with the government, so we can't do anything without the government. So we need to build their capacity. And also knowledge is a key entry point to country policy level and, and engagement. We also contribute to the uh, knowledge, also contribute to the scaling up also uh, in the South-South Triangular Cooperation cooperative agenda. And also we so knowledge support global engagement and resource mobilization. Knowledge also uh, finally play a key role in improving internal processes and system. And all this role of knowledge management contribute highly to IFAD impact, uh, IFAD operation impact. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, this slide is just to show how our uh, knowledge uh, we integrate knowledge in our uh, our work and also how we generate knowledge from each of our activities. And you can see uh, where there is the knowledge capitalization and lesson learned. We need knowledge, as Marie would say, we need knowledge at project design stage, as, uh, at a country uh, strategy and, and uh, operation plans. Uh, 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 designing, we need knowledge at project implementation, even during project supervision, we need to generate a knowledge on that. And not only capitalize knowledge, but also we need to share knowledge, knowledge from the project and so on, the best practices, the lesson learned from the project, all those things need to be shared and that they can then um, build on those knowledge generated by the project. Uh, next slide, I think we will see key of our platform on which we usually uh, promote or share our knowledge. We have uh, our site for publication, our site for operational tools, our site for briefing, like we classify, we have each site for each types of knowledge so that this also help our users and our audience to quickly get uh, the type of knowledge they really want. Thanks. I think over to you, Mary. Oh, yeah. the and the last two, I just wanted to highlight in link to the SSTC that we have also a robot solutions portal with some base practice and element we can share from the project. So now just, so this is an overall knowledge management strategy. So how does it link to project cycles? So I won't go into detail of this slide because Marusi already presented it. Knowledge is important across all steps of a project from the design, as we know, we need evidence to develop them, we need to build on local knowledge, we need to have already a knowledge management approach in the project with budget and personnel and a theory of change. And during implementation, um, they are we have monitoring, evaluation and knowledge officer for each of the project. And when we supervise, we have to see the quality of monitoring, evaluation and knowledge. But also we play a role of, as technical officer to document lessons learned, project uh, produce knowledge together with our knowledge management colleagues. And of course, we have a role in terms of technical assistance to ensure we can build and share lessons from other projects to support our project unit. And at completion, of course, that's where we have a lot of attention to document final lessons learned, extract the data, the mission, evaluate results. And we have some sample of independent evaluation and impact assessment that are done. So this is why it's uh, really inbuilt in our project cycle. I just wanted to give some illustration on also that our strong accountability to targets that make even more attention to knowledge is that we measure, we, we have a cycle, a, a series of core indicators which are common across our project that are aligned to SDG and that allow us to monitor, you know, what is our impact. For instance, here we see the hectares of land brought under climate resilience management, which is uh, very linked to the target 10, so we can track the millions of hectares as well as the adoption of environmentally sustainable and climate resilient technologies and practice and how much we are sequestering. Now we have a new biodiversity indicator, Longesia, so we'll be able also to track how we influence biodiversity. 
And here I just wanted to share because I feel it's quite useful to know. So how we track systematically, we have a platform in IFAD where all of our project, that's an internal one, but each time we review a project, we implement a project, we have to look at the different indicators and see how the project performs. And that includes environmental ones. So each time systematically for all projects, we need to see how we are do doing with climate change, environmental natural resource management, our safeguards, but also we have to check how the quality of the knowledge management, the m &E system and the target group engagement systematically. And then we have portfolio review every year. So we have to recheck uh, how our project are doing and our management is accountable. So they hold us accountable as well. And now I'll move over to uh, Mahusi to another very interesting feature, which is the lessons learned that we document in each project mission and so on. Over to you, Mahusi. Thank you. Um, here we are going to see how IFAD is promoting and is systematizing the lesson learned. And then um, on the same platform where we use, we put our uh, indicators on project and, and yes, indicators and so on, we also have a section for lesson learned. And as you can see, we have more than 1,800 lesson learned across our project on different thematic and so on. And uh, this lesson learned are from pro this lesson learn they usually use it for project formulation when they are designing the uh, project you can easily go to this platform and search for key lesson learned from the past uh, project and then see how you can make use of it for this uh, the current project you are designing and also supervision include the section of lesson learn as Marie Ott said and also um you on this platform you can also easily search for data uh, and identify key lesson learned next slide uh, this is how we uh, at ifad we are making we are making use of ai and we realize that on the, the the other platform it can be quite challenging to search for a lesson learn and easily get uh, the lesson learned you want. And then we make use of the Omni Data Platform and also AI, where we try to cap, um, categorize each lesson learned per thematic, per country. And then it make, easy, it make um, the work very easy, easy to, to search. If you want any lesson learned from any country, you just need to uh, click on the country. Even if you want to have the overview of the lesson learned, in the from IPAD project, you can easily get it with this uh, innovative platform used and integrate AI on it. Yeah, next slide. And also uh, talking about AI, we are also piloting. It is not yet official. We are piloting a a uh, a chat a chat boss for GP, GTP chat boss, AI chat boss for the lesson learned. We also have it for biodiversity. You will see down uh, 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 during the next the presentation of the next slide. And this chat, with this chat, you can easily type like anything you want to see on the lesson learned. For example, if you type, uh, how can we empower youth in Benin, for example, uh, you can easily get the answer. It will give you a summary of the from all the lesson learned from IFAD, you will get a summary of how youth can be impact uh, in Benin. And this based on the project, not just based on random uh, 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 database, uh, but based on IFAD project, a past project and so on, you will get a summary of, of uh, a lesson learned on that. Next slide. Thank you. And this is super important because when we formulate project, we have a section on lessons learned that is particularly evaluated. So we need to make sure we build our formulation based on lessons learned and things that are feasible. So now we'll move to how we translate, how we leverage, use, and what tools we've developed as part of our biodiversity strategy and biodiversity team on knowledge management. So here is just the overview of our knowledge management, our biodiversity strategy which goal is to protect, restore, promote biodiversity and its sustainable use in rural systems for people and nature. And we have four main kind of action, which is one of the big part is, of course, bringing biodiversity in operations. But to do that, it recognizes the importance of learning, knowledge, innovations, and partnership. 
So, uh, and then we have a number of elements in operations which deals with safeguards, tracking, indicators, and so on. Now I'll move over to Mahusi to go a bit more in details as she's the one managing uh, our knowledge management work in the team. Over to you, Mahusi. Yes, on the knowledge part, uh, first of all, we have our biodiversity community of practice. We have uh, our biodiversity knowledge uh, repository, also built on AI and so on. And also we have uh, on innovation side, we are trying to link, show how biodiversity is also linked to uh, nutrition and, and well-being. Uh, we have, like Marie Ott said before, we have our value chain and biodiversity aspect as well. And we always trying to bring uh, how there is always need to involve the indigenous people, uh, the women, and also not forget about the youth uh, uh, people in, in engage them in the biodiversity conservation and sustainable use. And for partnership, we are actually partnering with FAO and ECRAFT to uh, develop or to assess our about to have our agroforestry stock take, uh, which will be available uh, uh, quite soon. Um, next slide. Yes, uh, here is uh, how it is about our IFAD indicator, how we are assessing a nature-based uh, solution in our project. And we, we are using uh, ABC map actually in partnership with FAO as well. And this uh, uh, indicator has been uh, uh, co in, it is also in co collaboration with IFD and so on. And then with this ABC map, uh, we can assess uh, biodiversity at project design and also at completion, project completion, which is impact assessment indicator. And you can see, um, the mean species abundance in a specific area. You have the area where you want to implement your project. With the ABC map, you can do a quick uh, a mapping assessment and see the trend even in the um, uh, species abundance, in the carbon stock, in uh, the social uh, capital, and so on. And uh, yeah, here is some example of, of, of the map. Or you can also see key biodiversity areas if there are some protected area in the location you are going to implement your project so that you can have a uh, think of the some delimitation how you will also have some sustainable planning how you will not like affect or in, in negatively impact on those protected or key biodiversity areas and uh, also you can um you can also like uh up, upload or check the key activities your project is going to implement in that key specific area and then have a result of what is that like the impact of those activities in the future when the project that project will be implemented what will be the result of of that um that those activities and then from that you, you can also try to see if you need to uh, re or rework on the activities or like you will know what will be the impact of the project uh, in that area. Next slide. And this is a key uh, lesson learned from uh, uh, agro-biodiversity and how, how the benefit of agro-biodiversity on nutrition. And you can see uh, while implementing this project, uh, we realized that um, it is very important to promote native uh, species and also to to promote their conservation and so on. And uh, this project allow us to see that uh, the native African leafy le vegetable, we usually call amaranth or other spider plant, they really contribute to increase nutritional uh, uh, value of, of food, the people, the community, the rural community are eating and also increase their not only vitamin A, uh, but also the iron content of their, their they are food and most of this rural, you can see the rural women, they are planting this, all these are part of the knowledge uh, management and, and also making use of lesson learned from previous projects. And uh, yeah, 
this pro this specific lesson will show us really how biodiversity is linked to uh, uh, nutrition, how the use of native uh, species and also how the use of wildlife product or, or local species can have some good nutrient content and can contribute to the community uh, nutrient uh, nutrition status. Yeah, next and just slide. to complement, yeah. uh, as part of our biodiversity, we keep a, a, a sample of example best practices lessons learned for each of the thematic we mentioned. We try to organize them to have ready made examples from different regions and different thematic that can help us build the case, as we mentioned. Over to you. Thanks. And uh, this is also uh, other case study. I'm not going to mention all of them, but I will just focus on the agroforestry. Uh, from our project and so on, we learned that agroforestry can uh, not only reduce erosion, but also it can promote alternative income opportunities, can even uh, contribute to uh, carbon sequestration. It can even contribute to even nutrition and well-being. So yeah, this is uh, some of the case studies, uh, lesson learned from different uh, case studies. And the one on our group ecology was just from Nepal. And yeah, next slide. Yes, I mentioned before that we have our community of practice uh, within IFAD, and we usually meet every two years to discuss on thematic. Every two, two months. Every two months, yes, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we meet every two months to discuss on key thematics around biodiversity and also how to improve our own knowledge within IFAD and how we can also integrate or mainstreaming more biodiversity into our operation and, and activities. And um, when after uh, establishing the you know, a community of practice, we saw that to also contribute to the implementation of, of our biodiversity strategy, there is a need to um, design or have a biodiversity knowledge platform on which we can have all our um, our info document, not only from IFAD, but also from FAO, from ICRA, from WWF, from a private sector, so that when colleagues want to learn something, like want to learn about biodiversity and carbon credit, biodiversity and climate, they can easily go to this platform and, and learn from it. And we also have our uh, in interactive repository. Next slide, I think we have more details on those things, yes. So I have already talked about this. Yes, this is the biodiversity uh, uh, knowledge platform. I can share the link later on uh, in the chat so that it is accessible to everyone. And now once we uh, design the platform, we find out that it has been like very challenging also to quickly search for uh, information and download documents. So we try to collaborate with our ICT colleagues and then we try to use also the AI to um, link this biodiversity repository with our biodiversity knowledge platform. And with this repository, you can, even if you take a document from FAO, for example, on uh, biodiversity and uh, livestock management, you can, from this uh, repository, you can get a quick summary from that document. And if you want any things on biodiversity and livestock, you can really get that summary. What did this document say about biodiversity and livestock? And you get the summary and read it. And if you are interested now to download or go and read that document, you will read it. So we found that a uh, summary thing like you can see here on the on the slide. Uh, for example, uh, we click, uh, we 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 have our if at uh, mainstreaming thing. For example, we use those mainstreaming thing. We have mainstreaming thing in climate, uh, nutrition, gender use. So, uh, if you go to that repository and then you want any document on nutrition, you click on nutrition, all the documents on nutrition will appear. But if you want also something on nutrition and pastoralist, you can also click that and the document that talked about nutrition and pastoralist will, will appear and then you will get the summaries on that key thematic from each of the documents. You can read the summaries and if you are interested in going too deep into the document, 
you can then uh, click on the document and then read. So we found this very useful. And also like for the lesson learned, we try to uh, uh, have also our AI chat, biodiversity uh, chat bot, so that we also easily click, click on the things, yeah. And um, not to like not to say finally, we have uh, our biodiversity in practice learning event where we not only with IFAD colleagues, we try to um, enhance biodiversity, good practices in IFAD works, uh, promote and scaling up of good practices of uh, for protection and sustainable use of biodiversity. Uh, during those learning, then we also promote and uh, uh, our work on about if I, not only if I do we partner with other organization and uh, I think let's next slide can show how we collaborate with slow food and ikada uh, to present uh, to have a learning event on genetic diversity and how it contribute to climate uh, resilience and and nutrition and during uh, this section really bring out how it is very important to promote genetic diversity for climate resilience, for nutrition, and for the people, for uh, also to take into account indigenous people knowledge and so on. And all the, the knowledge or the outcome from the lesson, we use it as a, as a knowledge which can also contribute to our project design and so on. And we invite all the partners here, if they are interested in having any knowledge, any uh, learning section with us, we will be happy uh, to invite them and, and so that they can also share their, their work with us, yeah. And, and uh, this, okay, yeah. yes. Thank you. I know that just the last session is that, of course, it's not only an internal work, but it's also engaging in platform like this one and others to learn from others and share. So we also have an active work in participating to CBD related events, uh, CFS Global Landscape Forum, and we're also active member of several task force to also be able to share, but also learn from others on good practice on environment, biodiversity, landscape restoration. And we develop partnership because that's how we can uh, work if you is not them like written but of course if you is a key partner and now it's finished thank you yes thank you congratulations for the for the great work you are you are doing i was looking at the chat and indeed uh, even uh, between the fao and ifar there's necessarily some uh, lessons learned here uh, I, I can see uh, some parallels in uh, in the strategies that you have adopted but uh, in the end, of course, what we just saw from uh, from IFAD with this, uh, you know, going through a huge amount of, of documentation, having those uh, those tools and AI tools uh, to to help summarize some of the, the different aspects in, in finance, in nutrition, and so on, is is, is amazing. Uh, it's an amazing work. I hope we. And I think we said uh, we would have another session, a more technical session on uh, those aspects. Um, uh, would you like to turn to the question and answers? Is that if a few questions have not been answered? I see, for example, Maureen, I'm a student, uh, a social entrepreneur, and I have a project about adoption of biogas usage here in Uganda and skilling of rural mothers with urban farming techniques as a way of promoting biodiversity and answering a few of the SDGs, I am wondering how can I use this knowledge to ease my campaign? So uh, I, I give the floor to FAO maybe to start if, if you have a, an answer to this and, and after that IFAD as well. Who in FAO wants to answer this? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, need, I need a minute to reflect, yes. Yeah, yeah. So he, Basically, Maureen um, is doing projects, is uh, is preparing projects, and he wants to know how he can use the knowledge. Where is it available? And that's what uh, some oh, questions are myself. Okay, sorry, for, sorry. For IFAD, I saw that many projects are for your colleagues, your own IFAD colleagues, to understand how to do certain things. And I was wondering where this where there's a, maybe a limit between what is given to the outside world and to other users, like uh, like Maureen here, 
and uh, what is limited to to IFAB colleagues and FAO colleagues. So uh, FAO, if you want to start, and then IFAB. Uh, sure, okay. Uh, sorry, I misunderstood the question. Now I understand. So most of the work that we do is is for the general public. It's it's open sources. So most of what we presented in terms of tool and resources is available. Uh, we put the um, the um, the website, and we also put the uh, the um, email address. So the tool and resources are available. What's not available, of course, we coach and support. And I was answering by written to uh, to another another participant. Is the coaching, the supporting, the following, uh, the capacity development scheme? That's for our internal uh, country offices. But the tools and the framework is for everybody to use. For a short answer. Can I complement? Yeah. No, I, I was also looking again at, at the question. Um, we've been working, I mean, on documenting several examples where, you know, um, some projects uh, at local level, so like maybe the one that you are working on, no, to also expand the use of biogas um, can benefit from like a knowledge management work. Um, and, and for example, we are uh, trying to document and, and um, um, how can I say, a survey, you know, so like farmers on the ground regarding uh, certain practices, you know, new practices, innovative practices that the project was uh, proposing to integrate, no? And and really, so it's very linked to m &E work, of course, to see like, how is this practice changing, uh, you know, your food production and your income and your your quality of life and and the nutrition of your children and everything, you know. So, uh, documenting and 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 collecting a lot of data, uh, quantitative data on that regard, but also qualitative data on the perception, what is easy in the application of that practice, what is more difficult, what could be done better in terms of I don't know support that can be provided, like training and everything. So, um, having this communication. Uh, channel with the users of the practice that you are promoting and, and identifying with them, like really in a, a hand in hand, how can we make that practice more accessible to others? Uh, how can, I don't know, government technical bodies come in and, and support that practice also at a, at a greater scale um, is really critical. And that's really based on, on their those people's experience and the knowledge that they acquire as they apply the practice that you are promoting. And so, you know, making all those testimonies, uh, all those feedback is a very, you know, valuable source of knowledge to others and can help, um, you know, make this uh, practice adopted by a greater range of um, of stakeholders. And, um, and so in that sense, you know, it's really, I think about collecting the data, collecting the information, making those testimonials uh, available in a variety of formats, through podcasts, through um, stories and, and good practices, and, um, and, and, and then, you know, targeting different users who can support, as you've mentioned, this campaign of uh, promoting a better practice on the ground. So, um, and yeah, that, I, I think that would be something I, I would recommend. From yeah. yeah, just as a, as a compliment, as, as Mauricio also compliments, is of course, yeah, evidence and that is very important, but I think also networking uh, to be part of this network platforms. Uh, for instance, Mauricio Duxch is our focal point for the Global Biodiversity Youth Network. I guess you're a youth person as you're a student and social entrepreneur. And I mean, the more you can interact with others at different levels, the more they may add, um, they may adopt or not so it's one developing unit and sometimes social network you know facebook campaign we have different facebook group but i don't know how open they are to the public in ifat um, but try to engage directly produce youtube video as well because that's how you also generate interest first and try to get the data to convince um obviously uh, I don't know, Mausi, if you want to share, you were just at one of the latest um, francophone uh, meeting of the G Global Biodiversity Youth Network. Yeah, yes. Uh, apart from, yes, for the Global Biodiversity Youth Network, they are everywhere. And I think they also have uh, the network in Uganda. So if you are interested in, in joining that network, you can leave your contact and 
we will be happy to link you with them. They have a lot of activities and, and also activities ongoing on conserv biodiversity conservation and sustainable uh, use of biodiversity. And it will also, like we are talking about lesson learned, it will be good for you as young people or youth to learn from other and young people, how they are doing and how the activity is go, going, going and the challenges they are facing. I think you say you are in Ghana, so Africa, I can, we can link you to the network and you will learn from, from them. I also share in uh, our, in the chat, our biodiversity knowledge platform. You can, you can also try to join that platform. You will get some of our, our document there, our best practices, and not only IFA document, but also, like I said before, a knowledge product from FAO, from IUCN, from a WWF from TNC, from all the other uh, uh, UN and private sector organizations. So, yeah, thank you. We are aware of time. Still, we have a few minutes left. And I see a question here from Pedro Flores. Uh, thank you and good presentation. I have some question. What is the CBA of interactive of an interactive repository? I don't know what CBA means, though. Somebody might have to help me here. How do you connect with think it's cost benefit analysis? Is that true? Ah, cost benefit That's... analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you connect with other repositories? Which is the scope and lessons learned of applying IA, chat for biodiversity KM? So that's for IFAD, I think. We, uh, yes, on. that's for us. Yeah. No, just to mention, so we are really in the piloting stage. That's why we just shared some elements. We are very lucky that our IT, we have an IT team, which is doing a lot of things on artificial intelligence across the house with some partnership with Microsoft and so on. So the cost benefit so far has been, the cost has been quite low because if I is dedicated and investing in artificial intelligence and IT and ICT so far with teams, we've been lucky not to bear any cost uh, for that. And we uh, are still working on it. And actually on Friday, we had a meeting with the CBD team to see about ensuring, you know, uh, inter, I mean, uh, interoperability with other repositories, because indeed, if we have to update it all by ourselves, that's Mahusi that does it at the moment, that becomes very heavy and more and more costly. So I think we need to really build economy of scale and uh, partner in that uh, direction. So that's uh, really an initial product. I think it's good to indeed check the cost benefit and get lessons and make sure we adapt it to the users. And that's why also we started the chat GTP box because we realize sometimes, I remember this person saying, we tend to like to offer library and repository, but people prefer often to just ask their peers in networking and in, uh, that's why maybe chat GTP and others are also useful. So there are different ways to search also. So I don't know if you want to compliment on that, but just say, yeah, we are at the initial start and that's why we are engaged with different partners to see how we can enhance interoperability but also build it at a wider scale so that the cost benefit becomes higher, depending on yeah. the Yes, I just, I don't have anything to add just to say we are still at the pilot stage. And I saw, sorry, it is not related to that question. I saw so many people sending their uh, contact detail and I'm not sure if I will manage that. What I will do is to share the link of the Global Youth Biodiversity Network with you, their website. And on that website, they have the coordinator of each, the, the contact detail of coordinator of each country on that website. So you can try to reach out to the coordinators and tell them about your interest in joining the network in your country. So I think by doing that, it will make the work easier for all of us. Thank you. And just to say, we don't have a share in the Global Biodiversity Youth Network. We discovered them at the, at the COP15 last year. We just feel it's, a, as you say, I think networking, your social engagement is also important alongside evidence building. I think we have to work on both sides. Very much. Uh, we have now reached the, the end of this uh, webinar. Uh, in the interest of time, I will stop it here. I must excuse Eri, who had to go to an urgent meeting. We are discussing here with a, a few uh, participants coming from all, all over the globe to discuss about the indicators and uh, to the global biodiversity framework. So that's why he had to, to move to this, uh, to this other meeting. I'm sorry.
and uh, he, he he was we, we had a chat and we are very interested to know more and we will have another bilateral uh, discussion I think with both of you on how you were able to 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 make your managers and management understand the importance of, of KM but that's an, an entire other uh, project here but that we might be able to address in, in another uh, webinar. So thank you very much to all presenters. In the next webinar on the 10th of October, we have uh, we will address knowledge management for conservation and restoration success. We have two presentations coming up, uh, one from South Africa and the other one from the Global Environment Facility, which is the IFAD, but for biodiversity. Uh, this will be the six webinars in the series, and we'll then have a break for a week because there is this uh, substa meeting that we are running, and uh, yeah, and having a break will will uh, will be good as well for us who have participated uh, in uh, those many webinars. Dear participant, this ends today's webinar. The conversation can continue on the km.cbd.int uh, website. We thank you all for your questions, and uh, I will share uh, for those. Uh, to the panelists, I will share the webinar chat where all those numbers and maybe emails are shared so that you can uh, maybe use it. Otherwise, use the link that Mahousi has uh, has sent uh, here. So thank you for pass participating actively and we wish you all a nice week. See you next week then. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.